Good evening. Next Monday, Bezat Hashem, I won't be here. So next lecture here, it's, it's the following Monday in two weeks. Like I always say, check the day of the lecture. Always check in my website on events if there's any cancellation or delay or whatever the case may be. It's the best chance to check, not to waste your time coming all the way here for no reason. Uh, last week, we were still in the middle of the war. We didn't know what's going to be. Uh, the rumor was, when I got here last week, someone texted me that the troops went in. And the end, it was a false, false message. They didn't go in. And this war ended for now. It's a timeout until the following round. And uh, the, from political point of view, it's a very big mistake to stop the operation in the middle. Because when you stop in the middle, you basically did nothing. Two or three months later, already Iran announced they have all the missiles shipped to them. They're going to fill their bunkers again. So it's, it was really a waste of time. Knocking buildings in Gaza, it's a reward for them, not a punishment. Because they're all builders. All the Arabs are working in constructions in Israel. All the construction jobs in Israel since Israel became a state until now was done 99% by Arabs. They work in highways, they work in bridges, they work in buildings, they work in private houses, in hospitals. It's all built by them. That's the main profession. That's basically the main thing that they know how to do, to build. You know, since I was a kid, all the builders, every house you see, every new construction, it's all Arabs. And uh, the situation, the economy is bad as it is in Israel and a, a lot worse in their territory. So for them, it was a great thing. Now they're going to have a work for the next four or five months. They're all going to get lots of money. You may ask, who's going to pay them? Egypt, Egypt. Dubai, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia. They'll send two billion, five billion, whatever it needs. Money, it's not an object there. No problem, they raise the funds. So now they found the source of income. Up to now, the only way to make an income was to become a terrorist. There's no other way. You become a terrorist, Iran send you a salary. Iran used to be Iraq, Saddam Hussein. They always find sponsors. We want sponsors for CDs, we can find. They want sponsors to murder people, they find plenty. Why? The Satan helps. To murder, the Satan is it's his pleasure to help. To save souls, the Satan is already instigate. Let's see how we can prevent it. That's very simple. So what did you achieve? Knocking 40, 50 buildings or, you know, it's great for them. Now they all have work, they make money, they're happy. Knock down their missiles, didn't cost them a penny. It's already on the way to fill up their things. So what did you do? Kill the 100 terrorists? In the minute you kill them, a thousand were born. In case you're happy that uh, 130 terrorists died, you know, there's really nothing to be happy. The minute, uh, the, the, the week that 130 was born, I promise you one or 2,000 new terrorists came to the world. There's really no, nothing, to be, nothing to be happy about, nothing. That was from the political point of view. Why? Now we have to talk about the real point of view, which is the, point of, the divine point of view. <laughs> Everything comes to us, Hashem sends us, the Ishmaelim, descendants of Ishmael, to teach us a lesson. Yes, In this case, it's the Arabs, so it's Ishmael. You, you, you make peace with me, you'll have peace from your enemies. They'll leave you alone. You don't have peace with me, I'll send Muhammad and Saeed and Mustafa and Ahmed. Not to, they will not give you a, a moment of rest. How do you make peace with Hashem? You keep Shabbat, you dress modest, you eat kosher, you pray, you descend, you don't steal, no idols worshipping, no Lashonara, all the ordinary things that we have to do. One way or the other, we will do it. We can choose to do it, or we'll be forced to do it. And if we won't do it, it will be a lot worse. Better to be forced to do it and avoid the punishment than not to do it in the end and get a severe punishment. Because the punishment is always worse than anything we can imagine. And if you don't uh, believe what I say or you're not convinced, just read the Torah. don't have to believe me. Read Deuteronomy, read Sefer Dvarim. It'll take you a few hours. Read, see what the, the warnings. Read Parashat Vaitchanan. 
read some of the chapters that speaks about these things. And then you'll get the point. And if it's still not enough, I'll, give, I'll tell you what Gemarot to read. And, and in Rambam and other places, in Zohar, there's plenty of pages to read to know that you either do it or you don't do it. That's it. That's the, that's the test of life. Some people say it's not fair. If, if there's a free choice, it should be free. Whatever you want to uh, comment on it, I have an advice for you. There's two ways to do it. One is to go to the Western world and put a note. Say, dear God, I have comments on your Torah. I disagree with the way you made the world. I don't think the, the test is fair. You should have given us more free choice to do whatever we want. Why did you invent this concept of punishment? Of course, I once already had a whole lecture that really there's no punishment. It's all reality. If a person, uh, you put a sign on a closet, don't touch poison, and he open the closet and eat the poison, and he dies or he gets sick, who's to be blamed? The owner of the closet, of the food there, or the person who chose to eat? The person who chose to eat. If there was no warning, then I understand. Still, what you have to do over there, but if there was a warning and you still choose to eat, and then you get damaged, what right you have to complain? I don't understand. If the Torah comes, Torah is a book of instruction. If the Torah comes and says, this is what you're allowed to do, this is what's recommended to do, and this is what you're not allowed to do, and this is not recommended to do. And also the Torah adds an, a comment next to it. And if you're going to do it anyway, this is the price you're going to pay. What rights we have to make a beep? I don't understand. Why well, do we have the nerve to make comments? If there's no comments, if there's no warning, I'm sorry, if there's no warning, then you're right. Well, it's not fair. Why? Well, you're not telling me what I'm liable to? Okay, it's not fair. It's, everyone understand. If there was no warning, if the law doesn't tell you what's the penalty for driving fast on a highway, there's nowhere to be found, and then they decide it's going to be a million dollars, then everyone would say that this law is corrupted. But if the law would say it's $1,000 for speeding here, even though it's outrageous, $1,000 for speeding, but the law said it, you can say that the law is too strict, you can say whatever you want, but everybody understands that if you speed, you are foolish. You brought it to yourself. Whether you like the punishment or not, you knew it in advance, just don't do it. There's only one more comment we can say. Yeah, of course, we don't want to do it. We have our, our evil inclination. It's not ah, well, well, we want to eat not kosher? No. We want to make sins uh, with the ladies? No. We want to violate Shabbat? No. We, what do we want? We don't really want to do it. I'm not talking those who have no idea what they live for. I'm talking those who knows that there's a, there's a judgment. And they still make sins. Lashon Hara. After a minute, they regret. Why, why did I say it? What did I gain by that? Now who knows what I'm going to get? We're not trying to, set, to do it on purpose. It happens because of, you know, even inclination, desires, yetzerara. So that's a, that's a good excuse, no? Well, you're coming to punish me. Why? I did it on purpose, God. I did it because, you know, I'm a human being. I have my weaknesses. So that's also not an excuse because Hashem said in the Torah, you, you came to the world sick. This is your medicine. You take it, you'll be fine. You don't take it, you'll never be fine. Hashem said, I brought you to the world with a sickness. What's the sickness? It's called Yetzirah, evil inclination. What's the cure? There's an antibiotic. What is it? Learn Torah every day. Every day you take your medicine, you'll get saved. You want, the worse, the more you're gonna wait, the worse it's gonna get. Now a person doesn't take his medicine, and then he become a rapist, a murderer, a mechal Shabbos, an idol worshiper, a thief, whatever he is. What's the reason for the sickness that it's only get worse? He doesn't take his medication. Same thing, I had a case with one person who had manic depression, bipolar. So every once in a while he had an attack. Every, every once in a while he has, a, he has a, an attack. What's his attack? He gets hospitalized, they put handcuffs on him, they lock him in psychiatric department. It's like a jail for, for patients. 
And nobody asks him if to take him to the hospital or not. That's the law. They force him, they call the police, whether it's his parents, the neighbors, whoever it is. And they, uh, they force him to be hospitalized for two, three weeks. They inject tons of poison into his body, chemicals, until they stabilize his level. This chemical in his brain is uh, misbalanced. It's problems with the chemical. So after three weeks, when the doctors are convinced that he can go back to society, they release him. And when you're not aware of it, you find out that one of your students is in a hospital. So you feel an obligation to do a mitzvah of Bikur Cholim, which is, which is a mitzvah. The only one problem is that when you go to visit a, a sick person in a hospital, the main thing is, is to pray for him to be healthy, to get cured, not just to bring chocolates or flowers. That's also important. It makes him feel, oh, he cares about me, especially if you're an important person, the leader of the community, the prime minister, a rabbi of the place. Then he said, wow, look what person came to visit me. It makes him even get, it cheers him up even faster than just one of his friends came. Obviously, it's, it's psychologically it helps, but that only helps for people who are normal. People that are under heavy medication, they live in their own world. He doesn't even know that you came. The next day you say, you know, I came to visit you yesterday. He doesn't even know. They have no idea that you came. So really, there's really nothing, there's really nothing over there to, to do the mitzvah here. So after it happens again and again and again, then you realize. Now, the problem is, that's, that's the question is, a person like this, is it worth to pray for him to get healthy? He, has a, he already has a solution. I remember speaking to his doctor after a few times. I spoke to his doctor, and the doctor said like this, the sad problem is that if you only take his medication, he'll never have to be hospitalized. It would always, it would, it's disturbing, it's not pleasant to live with that, but I will never have these attacks. Never, I never have this. I can live almost normal life. Yeah, it makes the head heavy and is a little bit slow, but it's, compare this to every three months to be three weeks out of your home, out of your work, luck in some uh, mental institution. So somebody like that, there's an obligation to visit him, there's an obligation to feel bad for him if he brings it to himself. There's a question about it in halacha. If somebody tried to commit suicide on Shabbat, there's an obligation to save his life, to be mechalel Shabbat, to save him. He, to, he swallow 500 Advils. Now you have to take your car and drive him to the hospital. So you do it once, next Shabbat he does it again. You save him, saving him again, next Shabbat he does it again. I don't know, he's in love with committing suicide dafka on Shabbat to destroy our Shabbat. After once or twice, you get the point. There's an obligation to save him? That's a good question. I don't know. You ask me, I say no. We have to see what the Allah has to say. You know? Or he jumped from the third floor and he breaks his legs. Oh, my legs, help me, help me. Why did you jump? I didn't know it's going to be so bad. Okay, the first time it's good. Uh, you're dumb, what can I do? Just because you're dumb, we're going to try to save you. Next time, what? You do it again, so I'm going to have to ruin my Shabbat? I already had a case that one drug addict that somehow arrived to one of my lectures. Dealing with the public, there's always unexpected surprises. So one time on Shabbat, we're sitting in a table after, you know, the, we, we, the Shabbat meal, 12, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, the phone rings. So when the phone rings, usually telemarketing try to sell you a credit card, tell you about a new promotion or something. And this, and this, in this case, what's happening? In this case, is uh, this this drug addict is calling. He try to report that he saw God. He see the angel of death. He see God. He see the light. He see the olam haba. You know, 45 minutes he talks to the machine. Today, the machine will cut you off after a minute or two, but more, 13 years ago, it was a primitive cassette. It's rolling and rolling 45 minutes until the cassette ends. <laughs> That's how it was. So the whole Shabbat, we see it, the, me and the guest, and hear about his hallucinations. And then, what do you think, on Sunday, he remember he called on Shabbat? He doesn't remember. 
So people like these, we have an obligation to help them, it's a good point. I don't know, depend on the case, depend who, depend, it's very complicated, it's not so simple. Same thing if a person call and leave a message on your answering machine and he say, I want to commit suicide. Is it called pikuach nefesh, to pick up the phone and try to convince him not to kill himself? This, the answer is yes. But if it happens again and again and again, then no. If he, every Shabbat he calls, I want to kill myself. Kill yourself on Wednesday, why right? on Shabbat? <laughs> you know? So the idea is, there's a limit to how much we can take. Anyway, so the parasha of, of Shabbat is teaching us a few interesting things. First of all, we learn in the beginning of the parasha, Vayetze Yaakov mi Be'er Sheva, Vayelech Harana. Everybody knows this famous Rashi is Chazal. Most of the Rashi's in the Chumash is it's Midrashim. It's the words of Chazal. Most of the Rashi's is based on Chazal or directly is coding Chazal. His, uh, his commentaries is usually following the words of our sages. I, I said, I think, last week that most of the commentaries are like that. There's some exception to the rule. is the Ramban. He makes also some Kabbalah. And he's also has, he's very opinionated when he brings very deep moves in Judaism from his brilliant wisdom. And then there is the Ibn Ezra, which is a revolutionist. He, is a, he has a whole, his, his own move. Sometimes he even say things against certain Chazalim, which is very, very, it's a very, very brave commentary. He's a very holy man which was very, very holy, very, very poor also. His entire life, he was mamash hungry almost every day of his life. Not like today when you say, oh, this person is starving to food, or raev lalechem, that's an expression in Hebrew, he's hungry for bread. He's trying to explain that he's not hungry for chocolate or for beer. He's hungry for bread means he's really, really poor, and he has nothing, his stomach is killing him. That's how hungry it is. Every person that you say is raev lalechem has plenty of food. He has bread and he has even cheese and he has sometimes even meat. He doesn't have like the wealthy people, but still compared to the old days, he's still wealthy. He has what to eat, so he won't eat an expensive fish. He won't eat the best cut of meat. He'll eat chicken, doesn't have chicken. He'll eat peanut butter, it's not the end of the world. He eats some tomatoes, he'll have what to eat. Bottom line, when we say Raev Lalechem 700 years ago, it means really there was nothing to eat. Remember, there's no supermarkets like today. You go to Costco, you don't know where to start. Every supermarket is bigger than a football field. So we're talking different days. Very complicated, no transportation like today, no credit card, no money like today. It was a much harder life to begin with already. So if a person has Raev, means Raev Mamash, really hungry. No, I'm not talking about meat or fish or things like this. I'm not hungry for bread. Where can we make bread, a piece of bread to eat? So he was hungry. Mama, she was very poor. His students that had some money, some of his students decided to give him uh, some money, but he knew he will never agree to accept charity. He doesn't want any, from anyone to get any money from anyone. So whatever Hashem wants to give me, he'll give me. Otherwise, I stay poor like this, I'm happy. So they decided that they will pretend that there's a lost wallet on the street. And they, and they wait until he comes, and they give him the wallet full of cash. It will be enough for a month or two to survive. So just when, they, when he was coming, one of them threw the wallet, and they were all hiding. And then they see he walks over the wallet with his eyes closed. Like this, he walks in the street with his eyes closed. What's going on here? Finally, we put a wallet on the street, he doesn't pick it up. So they pick up the wallet. The next day in the yeshiva, they say, Rabbi, yesterday we saw you walking in the street. They didn't tell him about the wallet. Yesterday we saw you walking in the street, and your eyes were closed. Can you teach us what, what halacha, or was there anything in the Torah we can learn from this? Why you walk in the street with your eyes closed? There's no women there. The women in those days were dressed properly, even the goyim, talking almost 800 years ago. So why, why are you walking with your eyes closed? So he said to them, I was starving already for three days. Mamash, I was very hungry, hard to function. Three days with no food. So I started to be a little bit, not depressed, but a little bit down in my mood. That 
I have such a situation that I cannot even get a piece of bread. Then I saw a, poor, a blind person. One, while I was starting to go down with my mood, I saw a blind person walk like this on the street. So I said to myself, why am I complaining? Imagine I was like him. Never see colors my entire life. What's worse, to be hungry for, from time to time for a few days? Or never to see anything, to live in the darkness your entire life? So I decided to compare what's worse. So I decided that the whole day I'm going to be blind. So all day I walk like this, and I realize how lucky I am that I'm only hungry. So they told him, Rabbi, maybe you should walk in a cemetery. <laughs> if you walk in a cemetery, no one will die. That's where this expression came from. Im kavran, af echad lo yamut. You'll be uh, burying bodies, no one will die. Why? Because you're not supposed to make money. You walk in a cemetery, Hashem doesn't want to give you parnasa, no one will die. Because when people die, they pay the Chevrat Kaddish, they pay for the burial some money. Like this, no one will die. This is an expression of a person that has no luck, doesn't make parnasa, that's it. So, Vayetze Yaakov, Rashi, famous Rashi, when a righteous person leaves town, it's not just when another ordinary person leaves town. It's affect the entire place. You may say, how does it affect the place? There's another righteous person. This rabbi left, another one. First of all, it's not true. Because every righteous person who lives in this place, first of all, protect the entire area. And that's directly from the Torah we learn. It's not some midrash that we don't know where it came from, who say it. What, well, you sure? Did you hear the whole thing? No. 100% from the Torah. Why? The Torah says if they find a body that was murdered, they have to measure to what city it belongs. It's in a territory of this city, or that city, or this city. So for instance, imagine it's right between Queens, Brooklyn, and Manhattan, somewhere over there, and it's not such a clear territory. So they have to measure closer to which city it is. And then the rabbis of that place, it's called a Gla Rufa. They have to do a whole ceremony with a calf, and, then, and, they, and they say, our hands did not spill the blood of this person. What, anybody thought that the rabbis murdered this person? Why the rabbis have to come and do this whole thing? Which from here we learn that if somebody got killed in your neighborhood, in your building, in your house, closer it is for you, you have a part in it. Even though, of course, you never murder anyone. But if you are righteous enough, it wouldn't happen right in your backyard. It would happen somewhere far away. And this is the famous story with Rav Moshe Feinstein, Zecher Tzalik Divrachai, that he lived in Lower East Side. And he was learning in his, his apartment, you know, for hours, for hours, all the time. He was learning and learning and writing books. Holy man, very holy, very, the, one of the most perfect people that lived in our generation. And very humbled also. And, you know, everyone admired him. He was an, an amazing figure. So one time someone ran into his room, Rabbi, don't ask, just a car just hit a Jewish boy and killed him right here downstairs. So he, was, he told him, no, it's not a Jewish boy. It's not a Jew. He told him, Rabbi, I wish you were right. His yarmulke is on the floor next to his body. He told him, go, go check. It's not, it cannot be a Jew. Go check. This person said, uh, the rabbi maybe knows something I don't see. He go downstairs, he begin to check. He fa apparently, he wasn't a Jewish boy. He was a non-Jewish boy, not from the area. So he came right upstairs. How did you know? Well, everyone thought he's a Jew. The yarmulke is next to his head. Goyim don't walk with yarmulke, except the Pope. But it's red yarmulke. You can tell the difference. <laughs> no? The boy has a black yarmulke. How, how did you know he's not a Jew? You're not, you're not even downstairs. You're here in your apartment. So he told him, it cannot be that right under my terrace, right under my room where I learned Torah all my life, huh, thousands of hours, I gave, gave my life for the Torah, that a Jewish boy will get killed. One of my brothers will get killed right under me. Yeah, well, if you tell me it happened in Uptown or somewhere else, yes, maybe. But right under where I learned Torah and most of my mitzvot comes in this room, right under me, somebody will get killed? Doesn't make sense. 
So what happened apparently? A non-Jewish boy was running after the Jewish boy to hit him. The Jewish boy made it, a car was coming, he made it, but while he was running, his yarmulke fell on the floor. And the car hit the other boy. And the boy, the other boy ran away. Apparently everyone thought he's a Jewish boy, but later they found out he wasn't. But this story comes together with what the Torah said. The Torah said that when a righteous person lives in this place, his merit helps the entire area. The more righteous people we have in the neighborhood, the better and more recommended this neighborhood is to live in, even if you're wicked. Why? If, the na- if there's going to be something, this neighborhood will get saved, you get saved with them. Also, we, we have other proofs to prove it. We have other sources to see. With Avraham Avinu, he had a big argument with Hashem. Maybe there's 50 righteous people, 10 in each place. And Hashem said, if there will be 10 people, I'll save the entire city. Millions will get saved if there's 10 righteous people. 10 righteous people can save a million wicked people. For now. In the end, everyone gets what they deserve. But for now, it gives them an extension, another five years to live, another 20 years to live, that they can maybe make repentance and save themselves. What got them the chance? Not them. A stranger, a righteous person. That's why it's all connected. The Torah said that someone who wants Hashem to love him has to fill the pocket of the Torah learners as much as he can and have to fill their throat with good, good wine and many other expressions like this. Why? He needs your wine. He cares about wine. He wants to learn Torah. The Chazonish never knew if he's hungry or not. He lived 50 years ago, that's it. Chazonish. The most perfect human being that was in the world in his time, Chazonish. It's an extraordinary Chacham. There's hundreds of Chachamim, Baruch Hashem. All of them very holy. But they all had a committee trying to figure out what made the Chazonish extra special than all of us. They all agree. Chazonish was one of a kind. It's well known that his son-in-law said that he told him once between them that the Gaon Vilna comes to him and talks to him. The spirits of the Vilna Gaon from 250 years ago speaks to him in Torah. And not only that, Chazonish is the only Chacham that every subject in the Torah was 100% clear to him with no doubt whatsoever. There's nowhere in his writings that he, he has a doubt and he ends his writing with a doubt. Like, Kach nira la'aniu dati. That's my humbled opinion, or at least this is the way it looks to me, or, or Tzarich Iyun, or he stayed with, I don't know, the final answer. Every Chacham almost has it. You write, you read the entire Chazonish, people that are experts who, who knows the whole Chazonish by heart, all his writing, say so this is the only Chacham that everything, even though there's other can contradict him in Halacha, but for him, everything was black and white, no gray areas. It's a perfect Chacham. Why I'm telling you about him? Because he was able to sit three days straight without food and drink and learn on one, one page, one line, until he finally break through the understanding of it. And sometimes he used to ask people, did I eat today or no? He, he wasn't sure. He told him, Rabbi, you don't feel if you're hungry or not? So he said, I don't know what does it mean to feel hungry. His mind was so much into the learning that his body was already dismissed. It got to a point, people who knew him, that he couldn't get up from the chair. To, ride, to stand up, he couldn't. Putting every inch of his energy. They had to lift him and make him come from the, from the chair to the bed. How much energy he puts in the learning. And plus, he lived the most simple lifestyle. Couldn't be be- bigger poverty than this. A little bed that he got when they moved to Israel from the agency. Old chair, table, this, that, that's it. Nothing else. And never change his hat. We change the hat. Once a year, once a month, depend how wealthy you are. From the day he got his hat until the day he passed away, he had one hat. Fifty years the same hat. Nobody in the world has such record. <laughs> I promise you. Same hat. Never saw a need to change it. Never saw himself in a mirror. One time they took him to a place. He came out of the elevator. There was a whole mirror on the wall. He went like this, high. 
עשרה בית סיור. He realized, after he saw, he went like this, the same person at the same time go like this, he realized it's him. He never, he never knew how he looked. I can give you hundreds of examples of him, as only 50 years ago. Learning with such poverty, but real poverty, but never felt the poverty. So when a tzaddik leaves the place, it's making an impression on the entire place, the wealth of the place, the parnasa of the people, how many cancer cases is going to be in this area? I'll give you an example, if you're still not convinced. The son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi El Azar, that today is buried next to him in Meron there, in, on, all the way on the north, 10 minutes before you reach Sfat, there's a place called Meron. There's a cave there. They buried father and son. Who's buried there? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the writer of the Zohar, his student, Rabbi Abba, wrote the Zohar, but he's the source. The angel taught him in a cave for 12 years. They were in a cave. All the Kabbalah secrets that he knew, him and his son were hiding from the Romans. 12 years, he ate carobs and drank water. That's it. 12 years. You know what carobs are? If you see how carob look, you can't believe that somebody can eat it. Take one bite from it, it cuts your stomach. It's like pieces of wood with a slight of a sugar in it and seeds, inside seeds. Today you can't even eat it, it's full of worms. So you bite from it, to chew it, it breaks your teeth. 12 years, for, that's the only food you have? There's no clothing, you don't have clothing anymore. So they, they dig the hole in the ground, the whole body was inside for modesty reasons. You will learn Torah, you can't learn naked. So they put their, their body inside the, inside the sand. Now you know what happens if your body is in the sand one day, in a hard sand, when you come out, you need not uh, lotion, you need the entire factory of the lotion, the cream for the body, because it all got so dry and it gets cuts. Pieces, pieces of blood are starting to fall. The, the, it's absorbed the entire humidity and the, and the lotion of the body. This is how he was, this entire body wounds. And they learn in such, such holiness, and now the, the, that's how the Zohar came to the world. Not that the Zohar, was invented in his time. No, Moshe Rabbeinu knew all the secrets of the Kabbalah. Other Chachamim before, before him knew Kabbalah, but he was the one who was the source. And even with him, it took 15 years and 1,500 years until the Ariya Kadosh 500 years ago basically published all the rest with some interpretation and explanation of all the secrets of the Kabbalah. 1,500 years, almost nobody knew about it. Besides Rabbeinu Bechaye or Ramban, who lived seven, eight hundred years ago, there were individuals who were big Kabbalists, but Kabbalah started to be published in the world only 500 years ago. Uh, if without the Ari, if there was no Ari, probably wouldn't know anything about Kabbalah today. The last 500 years, we had few legendary Kabbalists, like uh, the Ari Kadosh, the Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato in Padova in Italy. We have the Gaon Mivilna in Vilna. We had, uh, we had uh, the Rashash from Yaman, the Rashash, Rabbi Shalom Sharabi. The, the, some say he's a reincarnation of the Ari. The Ari said before he left the world, he was very young. So he said, if, I, if I'll get permission from God, I'll return back to help the generation. Some say he came back as the Rashash. That was pretending that he's cleaning the shul, the yeshiva, sweeping, making tea for the learners was answering all the answers in the middle of the night and put it in their books until they, he got caught and then I found out that he's the holiest man in the world and the rest is history. He became famous, but he was hiding himself. Not like today, someone knows two pages, make sure everybody in the, know, in the world will know that he knows. He knows uh, one chapter in the Gemara, they ask him, tell me, did you finish us? Almost. <laughs> Still have 17 years to go. Almost. <laughs> The Gemara say, if, if you know one Masechet, if you know the whole book, it has many different subjects. So the whole book, let's say about Shabbat, you know you're an expert in Shabbat in the Gemara. Still don't know Brachot, still don't know Kiddushim, you still don't know other Masechtot. But Shabbat, you're an expert. You learn two, three good years, you know the Gemara very well. This subject of Shabbat. So they ask you, and then uh, let's say after that you learn another two, three years, so you know another Masechet, now you know Kiddushim. All the laws of marriages, this, that. So now someone asks you, how many masachtot you know? You should answer two. The Gemara say you're allowed to change, to say one, barely one. Why? Being humbled, it's not a lie. 
it's a good recommendation. Today, person know one page, he already say, you know, Rav Ovadia used to be my chevruta. But then after a while, he wasn't up to my level, so I decided, uh, that's it, I don't need a chevruta, I'll learn on my own. <laughs> you have people like this, you know? Chevruta means companion, someone who learns with you. So, so concluding this thing, the Torah, in the Torah we see, that when a righteous person lives in a place, his merit protects the entire area. And the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi El Azar, the Gemara says after he died, after he died, is they put him in the attic for 22 years without burial. And in Israel, I don't have to tell you how hard it is. It's not in Siberia that you say, oh, you know, the body was frozen for 22 years. It's frozen. Frozen, frozen. It doesn't get uh, rotten. No, in Israel, in the heat of 110 degrees every summer, for 22 years in the attic, his body was there, and it did not get rotten. Until after 22 years, uh, one worm came out of his ear. His wife got nervous. People started to talk about. So he came to her in a dream and said, don't worry. It's only one worm. You won't see any more. The one time I heard someone uh, disrespect a rabbi, and I did not con contest, I did not uh, argue. So that's, that's why the ear came from my ear, because one thing I did wrong. Bottom line, when, they wa when, they, when his wife started to see that people are speaking on the street, that he was never buried and he's in a house, the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, that's how holy it is. So she was afraid that they'll find out. So they decided to, to bury him. So when they came to, to make him a funeral, she called a few of, of the students. There, there was a city there, it's called Achbor. That's the name of the city. The people of the city did not let him get buried. They came, they blocked the funeral. So they put him back in the attic. He said, what do you mean? He said, 22 years since he's in the attic, we never had in a history such a thing. Usually, before he got killed, before he, got, he died, every week, massive attacks. Wolves eating the chickens, eating the sheep. Bad animals used to come, even today. You put chickens in an area, come in the middle of the night, coyotes, all kinds of things. They eat the, the chickens. I have a friend in Muncie. He bought four chickens for his children. He wanted to surprise them, so he put them in, a, he put them in his deck. And he lived in the second floor, but very high. You have to go maybe 30 steps up. Go up, then you turn around, and you go up again. Very, very high from the floor. The morning he came, all the, the, shed, the, the deck is bloodshed. All full of blood, feathers everywhere. The wolves, the coyotes, whatever, they, they smell chickens all the way up there. They got there somehow. It's very difficult to keep them. Even if you put them in a, in a cage with nets, you put them in a cage, you know what, what they do? They dig underneath. They dig in the ground. They dig, dig, dig. They come from underneath, and they kill them. It's very, almost impossible to protect them, you know? So 22 years, not one animal got attacked. No sheep, no goats, no chickens. So if that's not a miracle, what is a miracle? That's the merit of these holy men. We won't let you bury him. They didn't let. So what did they do? They waited until Erev Yom Kippur. One hour before Yom Kippur fast started, everyone is busy, mikveh, dad, last arrangement for the fast, quietly they took his body and buried him next to his father over there, and that's it. They didn't know. And from then on, the animals returned to town. So from here we see that Hashem respects the righteous people. It's clear in the Torah. Once it's in the Torah, that's it. It's not open for an argument. Things that it's not clear in the Torah, Sometimes you find arguments between the Chachamim. What did the Torah hint? Did the Torah hint meant this or the Torah meant that? It's an argument. Everyone brings his proofs from different places, try to build the case. But something that it says clearly in the Torah, well, 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 it's not open for an argument. The Torah said, Hashem said to, uh, Abraham said to Hashem, tell me if there's, there's going to be 10 righteous people. They say, if 10 righteous people, I will forgive the whole town. In the end, there was no, no, there's no righteous people there. The righteous people would save all of them. That's why the Allah has say, for instance, if a, if a righteous man come to the market to sell his merchandise, let's see, he also work on his free time to try to make a living. He doesn't want to get donations. He wants to, leave, to make his own income. So 
all the people, all the vendors over there, everyone who sells his merchandise, they have to close right away their safes, their merchandise, until he sells his merchandise. Once he finished, he goes, or even if he, if he leaves, even if he didn't finish to sell, but he came for two, three hours in the market and he tried to sell his jewelry or whatever he sells, everyone who is supposedly a competition in his own the same merchandise must close everything until he finished. Then when he leaves, they open back their merchandise. Why? We owe you gratitude. Also, I give another example. When they collect taxes to put guards around the city, there were gates. Usually some cities were surrounded with walls because of um, attacks, Romans, robbers, you know, bad people. But some places were not, did not have a fence, a, a wall. So they put guards. Guards with the horses, they go around with, with, with spears and, and, and swords, so they have to pay them. So it has to come from the, from the bank account of the committee of the town. They collect taxes. So the law is the rabbis of that place don't have to pay this tax. Why? If robbers come to town, does, Hashem didn't send the robbers to rob the rabbis who learn Torah all day and do good things. It came because of the ignorant people who don't learn Torah and make sins. They bring the robbers. Today it's very difficult because righteous people, wicked people, it's all mixed. You don't know anymore who's righteous, who's not. Very difficult to know. But I'm just giving you an idea, the merit of a righteous person. So this is what the Torah says. That Yetziat Sadik Mina Makom Osar Oshem. When the righteous person is in town, he is the beauty of the town. He is the glowing of this town. Once he left, the beauty, the glowing, the good reputation of this town is disappeared. You know, there was one rabbi in some city, I think it was in Russia, somewhere in Europe, Eastern Europe, in the old days, more than 100 years ago. So he came to town to be the rabbi, and all the people of the town are very lenient. What happened when you bring a kosher rabbi to a lenient community? What is lenient? Well, lenient means mekel, everything, just do the minimum that it's required. Rabbi, just tell us the minimum. Don't tell us too much to do. That's the minimum we, we, we should do, the minimum. What kind of tefillin? You have to, 800, ah, Rabbi, you don't have something for 100, 200? No, but you know, it's, it's gonna be done with machines. It's barely kosher, maybe it's machloket. It's all kinds of shortcuts. No, it's okay. Does anyone say it's kosher? Yeah, one rabbi out of a thousand say it's kosher. Okay, bring it to me. This kind of people. Oh, that's, uh, how come this meat is $10 a pound and this meat is $6 a pound? These have three different supervisions. This, that, checking millions of times. Make sure, checking the market, check here, check there. Same thing, matzot. Matzah for peasant. $20 a pound, $11 a pound. Same, ma, same matzot. Business, I'm telling you, religion is all business. Don't be a fool. This matzah, from the minute they went to the field and cut the wheat, cut the wheat, it was supervised 24 hours a day around the clock until it got to the factory. It was super, why? That one drop of water would not heat it and rise. Once water hit the grains, that's when it became chametz. <laughs> everything was supervised. Hey, humidity, rain, check, make sure everything is good. They check, no worms. So many different checks. And this one, only in the end it was checked. It could be perfectly kosher. There's a, there's a little bit more risk for the extra work that was done. You pay more money. What do you think? People work for free. And many other things. Same thing, like everything else in life. You buy shoes that are machine made or custom made, handmade shoes. Same price. This is $100. This is $2,000. Why? Same shoes. Who can tell the difference? Made in China, made in Italy, handmade. How much? They sew that like this, they cut with the hand, measure everything. There are companies who sell handmade shoes. $2,000 a pair. Orthopedic, special, they measure your feet, the curve of the feet, how this press here, the computer, that's with computer. The computer showed the pressure points. $2,000, $3,000 a pair. <laughs> Why? The same thing. Many other things. Sefer Torah. Kosher one, 30, 40, 50,000 dollars. Why? It's handmade. Feather. One letter, another one. Computer print. 
In one hour, I finish to print. This is two years to make. This is one hour to make. You expect it to be the same price? There was one faker, believe it or not, when people love money and they have greed and they don't have fear from God, it's the worst combination. So dangerous. God save us from this kind of people. They are the biggest threat, the biggest in life. More than enemies, more than terrorism, more than anti-Semitism, more than Hitler, more than anyone. They can destroy us for eternity, these kind of people. So what he used to do? He had a reputation that is one of the best sofrim. why? One time, somebody came to me and said to me, can you get me pitum aktoret? That's pitum aktoret. It's the 11 ingredients that you used to, it's called ptoret, you used to do in the Bet HaMikdash. Ten of them smells great, one of them smells bad. It's a whole thing. We read it before the prayer, in the morning, in the afternoon. So it's apart from the Torah. They used to write it on a special cloth, parchment like this. So he said, how much is it going to be? I said, about $200, something like that. It cannot be, he said. Someone was here yesterday. He wants $1,400 for it. I said to him, $1,400? I bring you two pairs of tefillin and you have change. What? For one page? It's like three mezuzot. That's how long it is. That's it. What? $1,400. What? So it's like saying mezuzah, it's $450 each. Doesn't make sense. He said, no, no, but he's a very good sofer. I said to him, you have, a, you, have a, you have a copy of his writing to show me? So he said to me, yes. He went to someone who bought it, and he shows me the things. When I looked at that, my heart almost came out. I said to myself, I sell tefillin mezuzot that I bring from Yerushalayim, from the best sofrim, and I've seen the top names in the, in the industry, and in my life, I never saw such a perfect writing. It's better than the chumash, than, than the printing machine. I said to my I said, this is breathtaking. Something like this has no price. Whatever he, he wants, you have to give him, because it's one in the world. I said, now I understand why 1,400. I said to myself, how can it be that the hand of a man wrote such thing? I had a huge dilemma in my head. A year later, he came out. That it was all computer print. It was faking. It wasn't real. Computer was writing it on a cloth. Put ink in a computer, you know, like the painting pictures that they have, oil painting, 300 each. If it was real handmade, it would be 40,000 each. The computer print everything perfect. One person who bought Sefer Torah from him started to look in the Sefer Torah and he saw every Lamed, the same Lamed. How can it be? Man, not one change between one to the other, thousands of Lamed in the Torah, all of them the same? Like this, exactly perfect, wow, cannot be. Then he looks at all the Sheen, and all the Sheen is the same. So he took it to a specialist, laboratory. They start to make an investigation, they found out it was all a fake. He used to sell a Sefer Torah for $80,000. Something that normally costs 25, let's say. And there was a huge line. What happened in the end? It was all fake. That's why it says <laughs> someone who has no fear from God, loves money, he buried thousands of people who lose their spirituality, like that person who used to sell fake chickens with his beautiful beard and nice hat, was sitting on a committee. And he decide which children will get accepted to the yeshiva. It was blowing the shofar. You good, you not good. In the end, Hitler was a tzaddik compared to him. Because Hitler killed the bodies. And he killed the souls of thousands of people for 10 years. Feeding rabbis taref. Chicken that was bought in McDonald's. I don't know, whatever their names, all this goyim company. Selling, serving in the weddings. <laughs> When it came out, I said, wow, Ishtabach Shemo, how lucky I never bought from that store once in my life. Almost everyone bought from there. I said, one time I didn't buy chicken there. I got saved. But most people, unfortunately, I used to buy there every day, every week. Why? And there's no fear from God. Everything is possible. Everything. And you see it today. You come to one person, you want to you, you you show him your tefillin, 
He tells you, ah, not good. Cannot rely on him. He wants to sell you a new pair. I had a case like this. I had a case like this. Someone who, I got him a beautiful pair of tefillin. And in the meantime, he went to Yerushalayim to yeshiva. And he has a rabbi over there who teach him Torah. And his rabbi saw that he's a rich American kid. And he said, why not making $1,200 from this rich kid? In Israel, it's his entire month. He doesn't get such a salary. So he told him, who got, who, where do you have this feeling from? OK, let me, let, let's check it. So he took it to check. He said, I tell you the truth, it's beautiful feeling, but there's one problem. I can't say it's bad feeling, because it's beautiful feeling. It's this problem, it doesn't make it kosher. So the boy calls me up. Wow, wow I'm for one year, I'm putting feeling. It's not kosher. I said, don't worry. At that time, it was 15 years. I said, 15 years, we sold more than 1,000 pairs. Everything was beautiful. Not, never had a problem. It's checked and checked again. Don't worry, it's for sure kosher. He said, no, no, I'm telling you. I said, don't worry, tomorrow I'm going to be in Israel. Mishamayim, the next day I was supposed to be there. I said, I'll come there myself and take care of it. Don't worry. I took the sofer. Together, we went to his yeshiva. You should see the face of that person when he saw our face. He almost dropped dead. As soon as I saw his face, I knew it's all fake. He didn't expect that the rider will come. So where is the problem? Uh, this, that. So the software is an expert. Right away, told him, who told you that it's not kosher? It's perfectly fine. What? Here, let's measure. <laughs> what? He started to measure. So everything is fine. Why? No, yeah, no. We, I asked this one. I asked that one. In the end, it was perfectly fine. I was about to take from him a kosher pair and sell him another pair. Why? When, they, when people have no fear from God, it doesn't matter how beautiful is their beard. I always say, people, don't be blinded by this. You have to be extra, extra careful. And it's hard, hard to find honest people today. Very hard. Very hard to find honest. When it comes to money, it's very difficult to find honest people. In Israel, you know, in Israel, they have a show, candy camera. So they put electricians. They call the electrician to say there's a problem in an in a alarm of the house. Something went wrong with the alarm. They do it on purpose. They have a woman in the house. They, do, they take one wire, they touch another wire in a box. They just disconnected the wire. In a minute, it should be a dollar to fix it. Let's see, the visit, 70 bucks, whatever. He, he came, he did it. That's what it should be. And they start to call one by one. There's a candy camera. And everyone in Israel watched the show. Imagine now if you're a crook, everyone is going to see it. <laughs> so one person comes and says, oh, I don't think it's a serious problem. You see how professional these crooks are. In the beginning, they build themselves a good reputation. Oh, don't worry. I have a feeling that it's in five minutes we'll be able to fix it. Oh, yeah, yeah, don't worry. It's my It's going to be 100 shekel. Don't worry. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't see this one. I'm sorry. Like, I really wanted to charge you only 100 shekel, but I, I didn't see there's another, one more problem. I thought, it, OK, hold on. Let me call my boss. Da, da, da. 2,000, 3,000 shekel, one wire. Then one guy came. One guy came. Not even, he was religious. He had the kippah sruga, you know. Not very strict religious, the way he dressed and this didn't look like any Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. But right away he told them, oh ma'am, you're lucky. Ah, it's only one wire, don't worry, here, the problem is over. She said, okay, let me pay you. She said, ah, no, I feel embarrassed to charge you for this wire. She said, no, but you came all the way, <laughs> I gotta pay you, I don't feel comfortable. He said, oh, no, I tell you the truth, I was two blocks away from here, I had a different job here. I was already here. You got lucky, it's nothing serious. The guy he came out. He said to him, ah, Yatsata Tzadik. Now he wants a prize. There's a prize. He calls his wife. He said, Oh no, so he said, My wife told me the day we got married, I don't care what, I always want you to be an honest person. And he says, now and, they, and everyone see him, what the Kiddush Hashem, that they had times that there was no business. No business. And, it, and they're struggling so much. And she, so she kept telling him, I don't care. As long as I know you're not cheating anyone, you're not stealing, I'm happy. So he gave the credit to his wife. So they called his wife. And everyone in Israel heard how the wife said, oh, I'm so happy. Like, finally, the truth came out. 
The truth in the end always comes out. If it doesn't come out here, it comes in a court of heaven, which is much worse over there. Because over here, people that you don't know will see that you're righteous or wicked. Over there, you have to stand in front of Moshe Rabbeinu, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Akiva, Rambam, and all your sins is right there on the screen in a court of heaven. Your grandfather, the holy man from Iran, from Bukhara, from Poland, from Russia, everyone see, look at my grandson. Look at him, worse than an animal. Where are you gonna hide? There's nowhere to hide. Remember once I, I told the story in a wedding, by the end of the wedding, the chatan and kala, the bride and the groom, the bag with all the checks and the cash disappeared. Midnight, the wedding is over, where is the checks to pay? Disappeared. All over, ah, they're crying. What a horrible way to finish the wedding. Call the police, the police came, two o'clock already in a catering place. Nobody knows. What can they do? Money is gone. Okay, no, the money is gone. Three weeks later, they get the video of the wedding. They invite all the family, finally the video came out. Usually the, the videos of the wedding are usually is disposable, which means it comes, everyone watch it once, and it goes right away to the archive. <laughs> and the whole thing, one time people will watch it, that's it. So now the whole family gather, they all want to, to see what's happening there. So after watching like almost three hours of the video, the girl said to the guy, I want to ask you a question. Isn't it now it's the moment that it disappeared, the, the, the bag? Look, the bag is right there in the video. He said, imagine if we see who stole the bag, she said to him. And he said, wow, that's going to be really a life-saving. So a minute later, everyone heard a chair is flipping over and someone's head banging the floor. But the floor in Israel, it's not like here wood. It's a real massive rock. Boom, the chair. Everyone turns around. The father of, of the bride fainted. And just as he fainted, everyone see, ah, oh, Moshe stole the money. He saw himself walking towards the thing and the camera is there. The father of the girl stole his daughter's wedding. Now, 50 people in a house. Imagine the embarrassment. Hashem made a system, security system, in a human being. When the amount of the embarrassment is too much, that a person will faint. Because it can get a heart attack if not. It's like a protection. It's like with the electric. You jump. Why, if you make a short, instead of the whole house going on fire, there's an automatic switch. It jump, it's seven million dollar damage now. Tick, it jump, it happens a lot. Same thing over here. If it wouldn't faint, another man will get a heart attack. He couldn't take it. Because uh, 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 embarrassment, it's a spiritual punishment. There's no end to it. It rises and rises and rises, it kills the person. He cannot take it. So he faints. For five minutes he faints, they put some water, they smack him, get up. Oh. Then he hears, oh, what happened? He faints again, three, four times. <laughs> Leave me. Then he pretends he's fainting. He cannot open his eyes. You know the kids, when they took something without permission, you come, two years old, you look at his face, he turns. You go to the other side, he turns. Two years old. You can't look at his father's face. How does he know? He doesn't know what to steal, not to steal. Did you take the chocolate without permission? He turns his face. You come to the other side, he goes like this. You try to look in his eyes, he doesn't, he doesn't let. He can't take the pain, spiritually, two years old. In the court of heaven, multiplied by a million. Because it's not one event. It's one and another one and another one. It's just not ending. If he's a person 30 years in business and every day is a crook, every day, another case and another. And every case has been analyzed. And a person is going to scream, okay, Hashem, just give me the punishment already. No, <laughs> we have to measure everything. Din v'cheshbon. Just not ending. All his sins in hidden doors, this, that, everything he did, all the show of how he was walking on the street and sweep the floor with his beautiful beard and laugh at people who don't have beard 
and then they bring someone who doesn't have a beard, they say, look at you, look at him, right? You used to look down at him, no? He never stole in his, in, in his entire life. And look at you, and now I say, wow, I was laughing at this guy because his yamaka wasn't big as mine. Why the name of yamaka, it's yamaka, do you know? In Hebrew, it's kippah. Yamaka, it's not an English word. Egyptian. It's a, it's a, it's a yare le malka. But because they speak so fast, it became yamaka. It's really yare le malka. That's what it is. It shows how much irat shamayim you have from Hashem. The bigger it is, the more fear you have from God. The smaller it is, nobody sees it, so you can do whatever you want. It's a, it comes from the subconscious. Like a person is trying to hide his religion. So every year his yamaka becomes smaller and smaller until it's the size of a quarter. And then if people still detect the yamaka on his head, he makes sure to grow long curly hair like this that he can hide the yamaka inside with some clip. I saw one guy like this. I looked at him, and I had a total guy. Then something, I saw something blue comes out in between, like <laughs> the fruit is growing on the tree. <laughs> one orange in the entire tree. What's, oh, you just orthodox? Yeah, what did you think? <laughs> like I'm supposed to see. <laughs> you know the halacha. The halacha is that the yamaka has to be in a size that from all direction people can see it. What direction? Whether they stand in the front or in the side, it can be small. Now, it doesn't have to be the biggest, but as long as people can see it from all directions. And many of the people have such small yamaka, nobody can see it. Only if they put their head down or something like that. So we move on. So the, the parasha, this entire hour that I spoke is only on the first verse. And we still have two more hundred verses. You ready for a lecture until the morning or no? <laughs> All right, don't worry. Don't get scared. So then, Yaakov Avinu is going to sleep in a Moriah mountain. Who knows where the Moriah mountain is? Mentioned a few times in the Torah. Today, when you go to the Moriah mountain, as soon as you go up, you get killed. Why? Ahmad and Muhammad will make sure to chop your head off. It's the Al-Aqsa mask. That's where the Beta Mikdash is to be. They put their gold mask over there. That's, that's, the, that's where Yaakov Avinu had his dream. That's where Avram Avinu had the Akedah with Isaac. That's where he sacrificed Isaac to Hashem with the story of the Akedah. That's where Yaakov Avinu had the dream. The ladder is going up to heaven. Angels are going up and down. That's it. This is the gate to heaven, to Shara Shamaim, the gate of heaven. And that's when Hashem comes to Yaakov Avinu and he says to him, I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, that you, the land that you land on it will be the land of your children. Who are the children of Jacob? Jacob, his name was changed to Israel, in case you didn't know. But even before it was changed, who was the, the, the children of Jacob? Ruben. Yosef, Levi, not Muhammad, Mustafa. Now, I don't understand. If I was an Arab, and we read in the Torah, and I know I'm not the son of Jacob. Everybody knows. I cannot deny it. I know Jacob is not my father. If I'm an Arab, somebody else is my father, all the way up to Ishmael. I read in the Torah that everyone taught me in a mask when I went to school that this is the book of God. So I read. Yeah, Mustafa now reads. He said, God said to Jacob, the land that you lay here, I will give it to you and your children. End of story. That's it. I said to myself, how can I make a beep? That this land belonged to the Jews. Right or wrong? Why Netanyahu doesn't stand in the United Nations and reads it over there? Because he doesn't know about this verse. Ask him if you don't believe me. Call him, say Mr. Netanyahu, with all due respect. Where does it say in the Torah that Jerusalem and the land and the place of the mosque belongs to us? He said, somewhere. Let me ask my rabbi. Call his daughter. His daughter is religious, Baal Shuva, from his first marriage. A very righteous girl. So he'll call her and she'll tell him where. But 
it's not only him, it's all the politicians. They know, none of them knows. They don't know. They know how to fight, how to hold a weapon. They know combat strategic, whatever they know. They know where the, where the, the atomic weapon is. They know some secrets. They know a lot of things. Torah, they have no idea what it is. Ask them if they've ever, ever read the Torah once. All our leaders, all of them except the religious one, all the secular leaders that sit in the Israeli Knesset, ask them if they ever read the Torah once in their life. If you find one, I give you a prize. <laughs> that they know the verses, they don't know, nothing. Anyway, so he says to him, this is what he says to him. I will be with you. I will multiply you. I will watch over you everywhere you go. I will return you to this land. I will never leave you until I finish fulfilling my obligations, my promises to you. A very interesting promise. Who here, or from our viewers at home, ever had a dream that God comes to him and say, I will protect you, I'll multiply you, I'll make you rich, I'll guard you, I'll do this, I'll bless your children. Raise his hand, please. It happened to anyone? Didn't happen to me yet. So, huh? So. Happened to you, David? Happened to you? Anybody? Didn't happen to anyone. Oh? Rabbi, it happened to you? <laughs> it happened. You have to let us know if it happened to you. Anyway, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Now, when Yaakov Avinu got up, what should have been his reaction? If it happens to one of us today, for instance, one person goes to sleep and God comes to him and tells him all these blessings in a dream. Your future is secure. Your children are all blessed. I'll save you. I'll watch you. I'll give you everything you need. I'm with you. I'll never leave you. What would happen? It will be the first breaking news five minutes later on CNN and in every channel in the world. I call everyone. You don't understand. I just had this, that. He has a friend in a newspaper. It will be all over. Ah, he'll make a party, invite all his friends. Hashem came to me. Me, not you. Me. He'll make a big party. Everyone would know. He writes a book, uh, interview to all over the world. Yaakov Avinu gets up. Listen good what's happening. The Torah is not stories. Every verse here is teaching a lot about life. Vaikatz Yaakov Mishnato. He got up from his sleep. Vayomer, and he said, Achen, indeed, Yesh Hashem b'amakom hazeh v'anokhi lo yadati. That's the house of God here, and I did not know. How are we supposed to know? There was no temple there. The temple will be built 1,300 years later. Actually, before that, 400 years later, the first temple, the second, the second one, about seven, about eight, nine hundred years later, the second one. Still hundreds of years later. And I didn't know. Vaira, he got very scared. Vayomar, and he said, Ma nora makom So holy, this place. This is the house of God. This is the gate to heaven. It's in the Torah. If he hallucinated, God wouldn't put it in his Torah. By putting what Jacob say, that means he got the approval of God, stamp. I actually did say it. God doesn't put lies in the Torah. So that's why the Muslim did everything they can to build their mosque over there. Because they read over here that this is the gate to the, to the sky, to the heaven, to the upper world. But I don't get it. You just read over here that God said that it's only for the Jews, not for you. For your children, Jacob's children, not you. You don't belong to Jacob's family. Why do you steal the place from the children of Jacob? Everything they did correctly, but in the wrong place. I want to build a house full of kindness, that all the poor people would come and stay by me for Shabbat, and will eat for free all week, and will take care of them, will do laundry for them, everything. There's only one problem. I stole someone's house. And I'm going to do all the kindness in his house. Kicked him out of the house. Every time he comes, I shoot. And I say, OK, now all the poor people come, and we can help you over here. Is there any mitzvah here? It's no mitzvah. If we, steal, if we steal the building from the goyim, let's say there's a committee here. Let's say there's a theater here. There's a disco, a bar, 
a bank, whatever it is, belongs to Vini, Tony, Mustafa, whatever. So we come with a gun, get out of the place. If you come one more time, we'll shoot you. We're a Jewish mafia. We kick them out and we build a synagogue over there. Hundred years, every day people pray. Is there any holiness in the place? It's equal to a toilet. Toilet. That's what it is. <laughs> a stolen place. So everything they do over there, it's a waste of time. The place is stolen. It doesn't belong to them. But this is our punishment. Hashem agreed that that's going to be the case. Why? We didn't correct what we need to do yet. But when Mashiach comes, everything will go into the right place, whether we deserve it or not, because that's it. Hashem said, in the end, when Mashiach comes, the world will come to his correction. We just hope that we'll have a share in it, that we'll be able to say, I bought Mashiach. You can say whatever you want. The question is, will it be the truth? Most likely, if we will survive to see the day, we can definitely say, I have a share in the arrival of the Messiah. Why? Otherwise, the wicked people will not survive. It's a part of the prophecy. The, the Savior comes to Zion, to those who made repentance. That means if you didn't make repentance, you don't, you don't get saved. If you made repentance, you get saved. Oh, that's a sign that you made repentance. Everyone who will survive after the Mashiach would come, is in a good condition. Some people will have hard time, a trial period, yes. But in the end, you got saved, you passed the test. You didn't get saved, no one will ever remember who you are. So it says like this, he got very scared. The question is, why he got scared? Everything is fine. God came to you, promised you, that's at you, his body now. Ah, from who knows how many millions of people in the world, you are the closest person to God. He speaks to you like you're like another God. You, so why you got scared? Okay, you don't want to make a party? You, want, you do not want to inform CNN? Fine. But why you, why you got so scared? The Chazal explained, because he said, how did I dare to sleep in the house of God? How? Ah. I didn't know, yeah, I didn't know. But eventually when God came to me, I was sleeping here, sleeping on, in the middle of the synagogue. There's a law, there's a law. You cannot sleep in a synagogue and you cannot sleep in a yeshiva. It's a holy place. Even to put your head down, you're tired, didn't sleep all night. You wanna sleep, go sleep in your car. Oh, there's a room outside, you sleep over there. There's a kitchen outside, you go sleep over there. Even in yeshiva, you learn there all day, you live there basically. You see the books much more than you see your wife and your children. You're there from 7 in the morning sometimes to 10, 11 at night, some people. So he wants to put his head down 10 minutes. It's not so simple. Not allowed to sleep. There's a Gemara. I ask one of the Chachamim, what was your marriage that you live a such long life, 120 years, your entire life is full? So one of the things he answered, I never slept a minute in the yeshiva ever in my life. Thanks to that, I live long life. So we see it's, an, it's a huge reward. He never put his head, he obviously was tired sometimes. Why? In a holy place, you don't sleep. You don't sleep. This is the difference between his fear from God and respect to us. We sleep, we eat, we talk on the phone, we text, we read newspapers. I remember when I used to live, when I lived many years ago in a place, I don't want to say the name, not to make them bad reputation. So I was looking for kosher shul. It was very difficult to find a kosher shul there because as soon as I walked in, I saw that it's an old, old age club. They all gather together. Some people don't even keep Shabbat. They all talk, talk, talk. Finally, I found a place that looks like a kosher minyan. But even there, sometimes people used to come and, and bring newspapers and open it on the table. And when it drove me crazy. So then I used to come and say, you open the New York Times in the middle of the synagogue in front of the Aaron Kodesh? I couldn't believe that the person has such nerve. So they, they used to argue with me. But then they saw I'm not leaving them alone. So they started to call me the sheriff. The Israeli sheriff is coming. When they saw me, 
By the way, he folded his newspaper. One time I said to this old man, shame on you. I come in, you worry about the newspaper. In front of Hashem, you don't care, huh? But it's in, him, in his mind. Ah, who is Hashem Bechlal? What, what is he doing? Why he come from Mincha and Arvit? I don't understand. Why he come from Mincha and Arvit? <laughs> you come to read New York Times in the middle of the prayer? There are people like this. Yaakov Avinu realized, Hashem just told me I'm blessed, I'm righteous, he loved me, he will protect me. What bothers him? How was I sleeping in a holy place? What do we learn from here? We all have this idea, Hashem will understand me. I'm such a tzaddik. I do, I keep Shabbat. I pray three times in shul every day. I learn Torah a few hours every day. I give so much tzedakah. I do this, I do that. People come to me, guests, the poor. I give advice to people. There's a whole list of things. So once in a while, I do bad things. For sure, Hashem will waive it. Doesn't even bother him. Ah, you compare this to what I do good? But you see, Yaakov Avinu didn't give himself a discount. Hashem just told him, you are perfect. He's thinking, wow, I did something wrong. Vaira, got scared, he started to shake. This is a holy place, and I slept there, and I didn't know. Then he made a vow. Very strange. If you read the parasha, Mamash, very strange. What's his vow? If God will be with me and will watch over me on the way that I'm following and will give me a bread to eat and dress to wear and I will return secure to the house of my father and he will show me that he is my God, which means he takes care of me, right? Everything he will give me, I will give him 10%. Maaser. That's the first time we read about Maaser in the Torah. Because remember, there's no Bet HaMikdash yet. No, that's like the, one of the first sources of the idea of giving back to God 10% for charity or whatever. What does it mean I give him back? I'll send it FedEx to, to, the, to the sky? Well, how, what does it mean I'm going to give him back 10%? It means give it to causes that he holds very high, highly of, right? Things that makes him happy. Poor people, widows, orphans, Torah, saving souls, etc. And everyone asks, what do you mean? Why do you have to make a vow? He just told you, I'll give you, I'll protect you, I'll supply you, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do. Everything was already Not life insurance, insurance from God. Why did he have to make a vow? What for? Ah, if you're already secured. You're secure. The Lord already sent you a letter, dear Mr. Moses, you won the lottery, 430 million. For the next 70 years, every week, you're going to get $20,000 check for the rest of your life. You worry? So now you send the lottery a letter, dear lottery, uh, if you're going to send me money, if you be good to me, and you pay me and everything, I'll give you 10% donation back. What for? They already told you it's yours. Guarantees. Stample. The lottery is a peanut. What is the lottery? It's Hashem. So from here we learn something very interesting. He was worried that he will make a sin that the blessing will go wasted. He would lose the merit of the blessing. This is very interesting. Because this is one of the, one of the big arguments in Jewish Ashkafa, Jewish point of view. Because we have a, a, a solid rule that every bad prophecy, if people made repentance, can get dismissed. Even the minute before the tragedy is supposed to start, if people repent and this, it can, be, it can be dismissed. But a good prophecy will never be dismissed. Even if all the people become wicked from the time they got the promise until the, the time arrived, they all became wicked, good prophecy will never be dismissed. Here, it's not only a prophecy, it's a personal promise. Is, does it apply also to a personal promise? Which means if God came to me, whether in a dream or if I'm a prophet, and he gave me a prophecy, and he told me this and this and this is going to happen to you. Yeah, you're going to get money, you have protection, you're going to be the king. Is it possible that, well, it's supposed to start in five years. Is it possible that, let's say, before the time arrives, I'm going to make such a scene, 
And then this promise that God gave me is going to cancel the promise? Is it possible? Yaakov Avinu held yes. Pachad Yaakov shigrom achet. It's a bit, from here we see clearly the answer. That even all the promises that God gave us, it's all conditional. We can do something and, dis and, and dismiss it. What's the proof? If God said to you, when you be 50 years old, you'll be the king of Israel. And you decide to commit suicide when you're 40. The good promise will never take place. Here is a proof. Why? <laughs> you can kill yourself anytime you want. No one will stop you. A person can take a gun and shoot his head. Anyone will stop him? No. If he really wants to die, he'll die. Then he'll pay the price. If someone will kill himself, he's getting judged as a regular murderer. Just like he murdered a stranger. Well, you don't, you're not allowed to murder yourself. Someone is dying in a hospital and is connected to machines and they want to disconnect him. So they're not allowed to disconnect him. But what happens if he's not connected to machine, but every once in a while he gets an attack and they have to run and connect the machines to him? There's an obligation to connect the machines to him or no? The answer is no, depend. If he suffer a lot from his situation, physical pain, all kinds of pains, there's no obligation to connect him. If we know for sure he's suffering tremendously, not he has a little fever or a little bit headache, We're talking serious suffering. If he suffers a lot, we don't have an obligation to extend his life artificially. We cannot, if he's already connected, disconnecting him is killing him with the hands. There's no permission to kill anyone with the hands, even he suffered the most you can think of. Because by disconnecting it manually, you're actually murdering him. We don't have permission to murder a person that suffers. We, don't, we cannot kill an autistic kid. We cannot kill, kill a handicap. We cannot kill a goy. Even we cannot even kill an animal, unless if there's a reason for it. A goat, you want to sacrifice it to God, it's a different story. Just to kill him, it's our bale chaim. Well, what are you killing him for nothing? You know, the Ari say even to kill flies is not good. Flies. Unless they really disturb you, the mosquitoes, this, that, yeah, fine, if there's no way to get rid of them. But what we see here, it, this, this question rises a lot. O almost every week I get these calls. Well, do we have an obligation? The doctor asks, do you give us permission not to connect the machines? Not to disconnect. The disconnect, they're not offering religious people. Only to not religious people and to go in. They ask them, do you want us to disconnect? Sign here, sign here. We'll disconnect him, an hour later call to pick up his body. To religious people, they don't offer. Do you want us to disconnect? Because they already know the answer. But they ask, listen, he's not connected. If you'll get an attack and the machine will beep, and we have to run and give him shocks and whatever the case may be, you give us permission not to run to do it? Because they try to protect themselves from lawsuit. Also, also, one more thing, there's no obligation to take the bodies to bury them in Israel. There's no obligation. Why? Because some people think, oh, you know, I'm going to take my uh, mother, my father, Lo Alenu, and take them with the El Al and pay seven, eight thousand dollars to transfer the body and buy a grave in Israel and this and that. By the end, he spent fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. No obligation. If you live here and all the family is here, you can bury him here. It's not a sin. So according to the Zohar, it's a sin to bring the body to Israel. If he's alive and he knows he's going to die in a week or two, then he's allowed to go to Israel while he's still alive and to die there. That's a ma'ala. That's a good thing. He already died. It's not good to bring dead bodies to Israel. It contaminates the land. Dead bodies have impurity in it. But that's a Kabbalistic thing. But the, I'm just saying, in general, many of the people borrowing money, paying on a credit card, taking them to Israel. Now the entire family has to go every year to the yard side, to the this, and spending $20,000, airfare, and this. What for? So they say, well, my father was a righteous man. When the Mashiach would come, according to the Torah, there will be the resurrection of the death. But the resurrection of the death will take place only in Israel. But all the bodies that lives overseas of all the righteous people, God said that he will make a tunnel under the water 
a big tunnel, like Midtown Tunnel, multiplied by a million, all the way to Israel. And all the bones of all the righteous people will roll in this tunnel and collect it all in Israel. Don't ask how can it be, because there's be millions of miracles in those days, just like the exodus of Egypt and more. They roll all to Israel, and they all will rise. They connect, and they rise, and they come back to life. And all the, the Rabbi Chaim Vital, he buried in Syria. What's you know, he's, a, he's the student of the Ari. All the Kabbalah we know thanks to him. Very holy man. A few years ago, rabbis went to see Rabbi Kaduri was alive. They went about 10 to 15 rabbis to his grave in Syria. There's many holy rabbis who, who buried all, all around the world. Like in Europe, the Rama, uh, the, the writer of the Shulchan Aruch of the Ashkenazim, there's many big rabbis who buried overseas. Once you see the holy rabbis buried overseas with no problems, then you know it's allowed. What's the question? If it wasn't allowed, they would do everything they can to be buried in Israel. So, sometimes the opposite. They say, bury me here. Like Rav Henkin in Manhattan, he asked, I want everyone to learn from me that there's no obligation to kill yourself financially to take the bodies to Israel. Bury me here in New York. And many other ones who were buried here or in any other place. Mamash, the last five minutes, I saw that all the sufferings of Yaakov Avinu came to him. I saw an amazing thing. Why? Wow, yes, he lost his son Yosef for 17 years. His daughter Dina was raped. He had to travel to Egypt to live there in Goshen in a foreign country, starvation in the land. And Esav, his brother Esav, was running after him. He had to hide from him. He couldn't see his parents. He had a lot of problems. Even when he stood in front of Pharaoh, he did not get embarrassed to complain to Pharaoh, to the Goy, that his life was bitter. That all his problems, if I'm not mistaken, the Gaon Mivilna say it, but maybe somebody else, all his problems came to him because in the end, he did not fulfill his vow. Believe it or not, how important it is to keep your vows. When a person promised to do something, he has to fulfill his vows. Not like today, there are people who go to the synagogue today and they buy aliyah. They go up to the Torah, or we buy an aliyah, and they want to they wanna go up to the Torah, so they make an auction. 10, 20, 50, this. Now, in, in weekdays, in Shabbos, every Shabbos, it's not so expensive in most places. But it comes Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, it's the two days of the year, then it can be very expensive. In some places they sell an aliyah for half a million dollars here in Brooklyn. So it comes to be very expensive. Now there are people who in the moment that they bid, they already know they'll never pay. Some people live in illusion. Maybe I win the lottery, I'll pay it. I have it here until next Yom Kippur. But some people already know I'm not gonna pay it. Whether I have the money, I don't have the money, I have no intention to pay. <laughs> I don't understand why they want Aliyah, these kind of people. <laughs> but they say, we're not going to pay. These people, it's called Aratzachta vegam Yarashta. That's why the Torah says, but Achav. Not only stole the, the vineyard from Navot, Navot Akarmeli, because his wife Izevel instigate to take this piece of real estate from him. In the end, he ended up killing him. So, Aratzachta vegam Yarashta. Not only you killed him, you also took your home. It's one thing you kill him and left away, or one thing you took his home and let him leave. But to do this and that, not, no leniency, no mercy, nothing. Same thing over here. Why it's Ratzachta vegam Yarashta? One hand, they don't pay the shul. On the other hand, somebody else who just made a beat before them. Someone say, 100,000. He said, 110. Is the other one say 150. He say 200,000. In the end, maybe $5,000 difference. Somebody say 200, he say 205. He say, okay, Zaha, you took. So now he's not paying. The other one would pay the 200. So it's like stealing the money from the bank account of the shul or of the yeshiva. There's no end to this punishment, no end. Because remember, there's one thing, you come to a, to a store, and you use the service and you don't pay. There's one thing that somebody else came to buy this product, they had a customer, and you say, no, no, I'm buying it, and you took it and then your check bounced. 
they lose from both sides. Over here, it's one thing if they never sold, they don't, they don't have a buyer. That's it. This product in two days will be rotten, some milk on a shelf. That's it. In two days, it will expire. And there's no customers. That's it. Everyone bought. He has one left. So you, you, you took the milk, and you don't pay for it. So what happened? Anyway, it was it's going to waste in the end. So you're stealing whatever the milk was. But then if another customer came with you to the register, you know you're not going to pay. Your check will bounce. And he wants to want to buy it, and you take it knowing you're not going to pay. It's actually stealing the money from their pocket. Much worse. That's called not paying their vows, their obligations. Some people say, Rabbi, up to how long I have to pay? Tradition, three festivals, three holidays. If he bought it, for instance, on Sukkot. On Sukkot. No, if he bought it on Yom Kippur. That's a good example. Three holidays pass, he has to pay. What? First one, Sukkot, Pesach, Shavuot. Before the following Sukkot, he has to pay. Yes, better to pay before Rosh Hashanah, because it's the judgment day. You don't want to enter your trial owing money to the yeshiva, the synagogue. I'm talking someone who doesn't have. Does he have an obligation to borrow and pay it? If he doesn't have the money, free festival. Shlosha regalim, he has to pay it back. And Mamash, the last minute or two. We find Yaakov is going to work for Lavan seven, seven, and six. All together, 20 years. Seven years was for Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. He tricked him. He gave him Leah. He said, ah, we cannot give you the younger girl. We have to marry the older one. So take her. Next thing now, he has to work an extra seven years because he wants to marry Rachel. He worked for Rachel. But he got lucky, he gave him a discount. Okay, you can have Rachel now. But in condition that he works seven more years. He didn't have to wait seven more years for her. So he, okay, so no problem. And then six more years, he worked for him. Twenty years he worked for him. Now in the end, he has to leave. He's an idol worshiper, this Lavan. Lavan Arami, if you play with the letters, it comes Lavan Naval Aramai. Naval means a despicable person. Ramai means a cheater. Cheat. If you play with his letters, you get a different name. So now, he cheated him. He changed his salary a hundred times. Aseret Moni means a hundred times. In the end, now Lavan, Yaakov wants to leave. Yaakov wants to leave. So he says, okay, give me... My compensation. I work in a company 20 years. You have to pay me for what I owe. You have to give me. Don't send him. He works for you for 20 years. Even today, there's rules. If you work for a company X amount of years, when one day they fire you, they have to pay you, I don't know, 15% per year or whatever the case is. In different, you know. So he said to him, he knows if you ask him to give him X amount of money, this, is, this crook will not give him anything. So he says to him, take all the chip that you want with the stains, with the birthmark, whatever they have, all these styles on their body. T let your sons take it out. First of all, one thing, when Yaakov came to Lavan, he didn't have boys. He didn't have sons. And the, and the dream of every man, especially in the old days, you know, is to have at least one son, to take his last name to continue. When Yaakov came, he brought him blessings, so now he has sons. Now he has sons, so he said to him, take, to have your sons take all the mark sheep, and now from now on, the ones who are, will, will be born with this style will be mine. The other style will be yours. He gives them an idea. And what does he do? When they come to drink, now from here we're going to learn something, and we'll finish with that. There's a lot more to say about the parasha, but you know, this parasha you can talk for months. So he says, okay, so he took sticks, and he made a design on a stick, the design of the sheep. And he put it where they come to drink. Why? The habit of the sheep, that they have intimate relation when they come together, male and female, they all come to drink. You know, animals, sometimes we behave worse than animals. But they, come, they, they, they do what they do over there, and they become pregnant. But 
he want the females to become pregnant when they look at this image. Why? We learn from here something for us. According to the Kabbalah, it's the same thing applies to people. That what the woman see in the night that she conceive affect the shape of the baby. What kind of baby you're gonna have? Yaakov or Esav, Muhammad or Yosef? It's depend what you see. It's affecting. That's why they say when a woman comes out of the mikveh and she goes to be with her husband, make sure not to see any monster on the streets. Better he picks her up or somebody, her son, a daughter, somebody reliable. Not to see anyone. That's why Rabbi Ochanan in the Gemara was sitting by the gate of the mikveh that all the women will come and see him because he was a very pretty man, handsome man, and a very holy man. All his life learned Torah. One of the legendary, holiest people ever lived. And they asked him, you're not afraid of Ayn Arad to die from evil eye? He said, no, I'm from the descendants of Joseph. Joseph in the Torah has a special protection from evil eye. So we see he was sitting by the mikveh. It's a solid rule. Every woman will look at my face that I have pretty kids. Why it's important to be handsome or pretty? It opens a lot of doors in life. Check statistically. Which salesmen do better? Both of them knows how to talk. One who is nice looking, one who is ugly. The one who is nice looking guaranteed to sell double than the ugly one. They both speak beautiful about the product. People follow beauty. Most people are shallow. They only go by the outside. They don't check the inside. The outside effect, that's why in television, in commercial, they never bring ugly people to talk. Then they sell cigarettes, they have to bring the most beautiful woman in the world to show that she smoke. Can't bring some ugly woman to smoke? You want to promote a cigarette? No. An ugly woman will smoke the opposite. No one would want this cigarette. It's not cool. And etc. cetera, et cetera. They have all research about it. Tens of years of research. What sells? Not to talk about all the hidden things that they put in a commercial, all kinds of music and things that you don't hear. Only in your subconscious get it. It's colors, fast images that you don't see, all kinds of tricks. So what's happening here? All the ship that saw what they saw, yeah, they, they gave birth to goats, just like Yaakov said that it's going to be mine. So what do we see here? We, ha we have an answer for halacha here. Sometimes people ask if my boss steals money from me. Every month he takes, he steals $1,000 for my commission. No doubt, guarantee. This is the contract that he pays me 10% commission. Always find excuses and give me 7% commission. Now I'm working there two years, already $10,000 cash he stole from my pocket. Now somebody by mistake came to give him $10,000 cash that he owe him. Any by mistake saw me on the street, so you work for this guy, for this uh, Mr. X? Yeah, here, give him this 10,000 I owe him. Now I have the 10,000 in my hand. I have to give it to him or I can take it because he stole the 10,000 from me. So if he came to my hand automatically, I didn't do anything to break into his property to take, then for sure I can take it. The arguments in Egmara is if I can do din to myself to break into his place and break his head and take it. To go into his own house, he opened the door, boom, smash his teeth, go inside and take what he owes me. You want to know the truth? What's allowed, what's not allowed? You have to start learning. It's many different scenarios. But if the money came to you, you can keep them, if you know 100%. If there's any doubt, you're not allowed to touch you. Maybe has shown become a thief. But what happens if you go into someone's house and he borrowed from you something three years ago and he doesn't return it. I don't know, he took your tie. Can, I, can you lend me the tie tonight? I'm going out with my wife. First date is his date. Yeah, here, take $50 tie. He doesn't return. Pretend he forgot. Few times you hinted to him, doesn't return. One day he invites you. Come, come. You see the tie over there. You know, you have your initials there. See your initials over there. Why M in the back? It didn't happen to me, relax. So, now you see your tie. Can you take it? Of course you take it, in his face. Don't have to be embarrassed. Oh, here is my tie, thank you. No, no, oh, don't take it. What do you mean, no, it's mine. 
when the object is yours, it's not talking money. Money, it's always exchanging. It's never the same bills. One time is this, then, then the next day is different money. You give somebody ten, ten uh, hundred dollar bill. A year later, he returns you the same bills. No, something else. So, or you give him sugar now. One pound of sugar, two months later, he returns one pound of sugar. It's different things. But over here, it's the actual product. If this is my notebook with my initials and it's by him right now, and I want to take it, I don't need his permission. The question is, am I allowed to break into his property to take it or not? That's already a different story. But if I'm already invited in, I'm in, or my son is in, I can tell him, take it, it's mine, because he doesn't return it. Over here, Yaakov Avinu had to do a trick to get what he deserved. And of course, it's all from Hashem. Hashem decides who's going to get birth, born. But all of them, what they saw, the stains that he drew on a stick, it's affected the babies. And that's how he took a lot of sheep and he became wealthy. And it went crazy, Lavan. Wow, everyone was born like him. And still ran after him to get it back, like Paro. 210 years, 85 years, 86 years of slavery, 210 years in Egypt. 80, since Yosef died, 85 years of horrible Holocaust. And what happened in the end? They chased them. After finally they came out, they chased them. This is what we say in the Haggadah of Pesach. Bikesh Lavan la'akor et hakol. Lavan, Lavan plan was to destroy the future of the Jewish nation. Why? Well, I'll kill Yaakov. That's it. We won't be here. No Yaakov, no Torah, no Judaism, no nothing. Hashem had to interfere with the free choice of a wicked person that was on the way to kill a righteous man and come to him like a prophecy. To a wicked person, filthy person, a crook, a murderer, whatever you want, everything he had. And say, I'm warning you, if one hair will fall from the head of the tzaddik, you have a big problem with me. Which means if Hashem wouldn't warn him, he was on the way to kill him, to do whatever he did. And what happened in the end? Rachel died. Why? He said, where is my idols? Where is my idols? She took the idol. Why she took the idol? She doesn't want her father to worship an idol. So she did a mitzvah or no? She could burn the idols. She doesn't need permission. If somebody bought a million dollar idol, Buddha, pure gold, million dollar, and he puts it in his house, and you go in, you can take the idol and burn it and smash it, and he cannot sue you. Take you to Bedin, say, very good, Sharkoach. Thank you very much. Next time, burn the entire house. Why? You don't need his permission. He has pornographic things in his house. You can burn it. You don't need permission from him. He has all kinds of things that are against the Torah. You have pure permission to destroy it. He has a lawsuit against you. It's his problem. Why? You're saving his soul and he wants to sue you. Right now he gets angry for the money he lost. When he comes to the court of heaven, he'll never stop blessing you for burning it. So this is halachot. What's allowed, what's not allowed. Not everything is allowed. You have to know if it's pure sin or not. So now I don't get one thing. I will leave you with one question to think about. Just 10 minutes ago, the creator of the world came to you in a dream and said, be careful not to touch my son Jacob. You have a problem with him, you have a problem with me. After that, how does he come and say, where is my idol? You stole my God. If it happened to me, I would be embarrassed to talk about this God, this fake God. How do you ask? For? Imagine now uh, some Christian pope or, or priest, God comes to him in a dream and says, listen, I'm warning you, don't touch the, 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 an inch of this rabbi's uh, body. Be very careful. And I see who's the real God. JC is not the real God. And then there's a statue of JC. Would I ask for it? I would hide under the rug, 10 floors under the ground from the embarrassment that I used to waste my time on this idol. Now, what does he say? Where is my idol? And Yaakov say, you're suspecting me I stole your idol? What, I'm a thief? The one who stole your idol should be killed, chas v'shalom. And she was sitting on it, on a camel. Uh, when she was supposed to rise for her father, she said, I have my period, I cannot stand. Because if she would stand, it would fall from the camel, he would see it. He looked all over, he didn't believe Yaakov. 
20 years he worked for him. He know he's not a thief. He know he tricked him. A thousand, a hundred times you took advantage on him. You cheated him on a money, on a salary. You cheated him on, uh, on a marriage. He never stole a penny from you. Never cheated you, nothing. You ch go inside his house and you check everywhere. This is the kind of person we're dealing with. And what happened in the end? Yaakov said, if I stole it, I should get killed. What happened? His wife got killed. Rachel. She died on the way in Bethlehem over there. She buried the, the mother of the Jewish nation, Rachel Imenu. Why? She's the one who stole the train. She made a mitzvah. Look at the mouth of a tzaddik, what comes of a righteous man's uh, mouth, even by mistake. Kilelat chacham al tnai. It's a curse of a, of a blessing, even on condition. Even the condition was not fulfilled, it can still hurt a person. He said, if you're going to hit Moshe, I'm going to pray that you die. And he didn't touch Moshe, he can still die. Just because it came out of his mouth, holy mouth like this. What do we see here? One thing. Sometimes we are worse than this Lavan. We see God, we see the truth, we watch Torah and science, we know the Torah is divine. A week later, Christine, you coming with me to the bar? Wow, what happened? You just two weeks ago, you cry. Wow, Hashem, why Elohim? Hashem, Hashem, El Rachum Vechanun. Yom Kippur finish. Two hours later, he's already smoking hookah in Astoria with the Greeks over there. Same thing, Lavan. That's what the Gemara says. Reshaim al pitcha shel gehinom enam chozrim b'tshuva. Someone who is a classy, wicked person, and the gate of hell, see the, the furnace, the fire, still doesn't say, God, forgive me, I, I'm wrong, I made a mistake. I was right, I don't care. Whatever happened, happened. Just like this Rasha, Chaim Guri, whatever his name was in Israel, now died, Shem Reshaim Irkav, he said before he died, I forbid you for saying Kaddish for me. Don't say Kaddish on me, he says. <laughs> the fool. Now he eats his heart for eternity. Haifer, <laughs> Chaim Hefer, sorry. Chaim Hefer, that's his name. Whatever. That, the name is not relevant. The idea here. My ego will win. You're not going to tell. Usually, the, some wicked people, just before they die, they at least become religious. Rabbi, can you give me bracha? I don't feel good. I'm in a hospital, in a cancer department. He becomes a little religious. He, moments before he die, make sure he don't say Kaddish for my soul. Why? My ego, if I will ask you to say Kaddish for my soul, that's like admitting that I lived 75 years in a lie. I rather go to hell, I rather suffer for thousands of years, as long as I left the world with no signs of regret. Like who? Adolf Eichmann, same story. Normal person would say, I'm very sorry. I ask from the Jewish people that for what I did, what I've done, please forgive me if there's any way. Please, God, forgive me. OK, now kill me. What does he want? A glass of wine, steak, and a German newspaper. Never say, forgive me, until the last second. Moment before they hung him, no regret whatsoever. You understand what's happening? That's called Reshaim, wicked people, and the gate of hell do not make tshuva. Why? Like Pharaoh. Hashem is hitting him and hitting him, and Egypt is destroyed. I don't care. Let everyone die. I'll go to the end. Same thing, Bashar, what's his name? Bashar Assad? Not that I... In Egypt? Look what's happening now in Syria. Your name in Syria, nobody wants you. Your nation don't want you. Ooh, it doesn't matter who's right. You can be right. They're wrong. Whatever the case is, politics, whatever. But uh, you see man, thousands of people already for two years are getting killed just to get rid of you. Just give up already. They offered him already to hide with all his billions that he has, to hide to some country and to be secure for the rest of his life. You know? No. That's, called, that's what the Ramban writes about Paro. That's what Hashem said to Moshe. Up to now, Pharaoh had his free choice. Since he fell, he did not choose to do the right thing. From now on, I will eliminate his free choice. Why? I want to destroy him for eternity. Now everyone would see what I'm going to do to him and to his people for not getting rid of him earlier. 
You understand what's happening? It can happen to us. It's not only to Pharaoh. That Hashem give us six, seven, eight, fifteen chances, and then we didn't take it, and then when we want to be religious, Hashem say, too late, my friend, you missed the train. So the idea is what we say, Shuv Sha'achat Kodem, return an hour earlier from your plan. Don't wait until Chas Shalom, the gate of repentance will be locked. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen.